we wanted to get together so we can have a chance to get to meet the ATG team and uh, just ask some questions on, I just have an open conversation, open dialogue. You know, 2020 has been a very strange year for all of us. A lot of challenges um, that could be working in the cloud. Uh, just, a, we all know 2020, very, very strange year. But there's a lot we can do to help each other out. A lot of things, lessons learned. And these are some of the things we want to talk about. Just, just um, how we can help you guys out and just have an open dialogue. So kick it off from here. Um, let's take a walk around the room here. Frank, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Frank Beamert. Um, I'm a senior technician, also the production product manager for APG. Um, we take on all kinds of production work too, if you guys need any help out there with that. Um, been in the business for nearly 25 years now. Um, and prior to that, I spent about 15 years out in the field running equipment and setting grades. So, very familiar with how Civil 3D works and what it needs to be used for. Hey, Kyle. Hey everybody, my name is Kyle Groves. I am an EIT and a senior technical specialist here at ATG. Uh, what that means is I work on just about everything. Although my primary focus is on consulting, I work regularly with a couple of major firms throughout the Midwest and the rest of the country to help make sure that their CAD standards are doing what they want them to do, trying to help prioritize and balance initiatives for learning new tools, making things better, whether it's training, workflow documentation, or just simple template upgrades because we needed a new style. Uh, also do things like training and some technical support here and there, uh, given our fantastic support team, the assistance they need when they get into something really deep in the weeds for Civil 3D. But I've been in the industry as a whole for about six years, uh, three years with ATG, uh, two years of solid waste uh, design experience before that, and another year in small commercial and residential. Jason. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Hartley. Senior Technical Specialist here at ATG. Uh, September marks my second year at ATG, but uh, I've been in the civil industry since about 1997. So uh, coming up on math, it's beyond what I care to do anymore. Um, I specialize in you know, consulting as well, um, CAD management, training, uh, t tech support, you know, whatever you need. Uh, my experience is, is mainly with Civil 3D and the Autodesk side, but I also do uh, a lot of Infoworks, some Esri, some Bluebeam, uh, everything that most of our clients need on the AEC side, especially on the civil side. Um, I've got experience with that, and that's where I tend to, to gravitate towards, you know, anything I can do to, to help firms uh, help themselves, essentially, um, so they're being productive and efficient with the software that they're kind of forced to use. Yeah. So I'm Rob Bigelow. I've been in the industry uh, since 97 as well. Very similar background. I got some GIS in there. I got some uh, civil 3D. Um, love what I do. You know, we work with clients on just helping them with more efficient workflows and just how to use the software. And this is something, uh, this, this is a great, great topic here because um, we're all in face different challenges, but similar challenges at the same time. And it's kind of an open forum here. So I allowed everyone to speak on here. And this is, we wanna open it up to everybody. And if anyone has any specific topics they'd like to bring up on just how, or just comments on how you guys as an organization get through this and how you've been able to work remote, how you've been able to um, just uh, utilize the tools with Civil 3D and just in the industry to, you know, get through some of the, the muck that we've been trudging through together. And we could start off by just talking about um, what's a good topic to start off guys here, maybe BIM 360 on collaboration for civil. Does anyone in the group here, and you guys should be able to unmute and talk, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, has anyone had a chance to use that yet or understand what it is? No, we got a got a quiet group today. Um, Jason, or I, I, I'm going to point to Jason on this one. How have we used it within, or how have we helped our clients with BIM 360? 
You know, BIM 360 is, is fairly new to the civil world. It's been out for a couple of years on the Revit side and with collaboration for Revit, but you know, its introduction to civil has been new. And our, uh, our main focus has been helping our clients be aware of this. Um, I see a couple of folks on the call who, you know, we've done demos for to let them know how this works and how it can help them. Uh, and we've started implementing it for a, a number of firms who are struggling with the whole quick transition to remote work. Um, maybe they don't have a VPN in place or they don't want to do remote desktop. You know, how do we let people go home and still have access to their projects? And BIM 360 has been instrumental with that. So uh, we've helped a few firms get used to it and, and know what it can and can't do. Um, and, you know, figure out its limitations. It's still not 100% perfect, um, but they're quickly making upgrades to um, to the software and especially with all the different moving components that it needs, like the desktop connector, what version of Civil 3D, of course, uh, makes a difference as well. And then just some of the best practices. So Jason, what would, uh, or definitely the audience, if you have some comments that you wanna throw in here, feel free to stop us at any time. But Jason, you know, we were talking about what some of the challenges have been with this, but what are some really compelling reasons to move toward BIM 360 as opposed to some of the other options that are out there these days? Well, part of it is it's very uh, powerful when it comes to opening software or opening drawings and opening files. So you can uh, do some red lines through your AutoCAD drawing or even Revit models or Infoworks models, Navisworks coordination models, PDF files. It can open up a bunch of things natively to wherever you have a, an internet connection. So technically you could open up your smartphone and download the latest corridor model, take measurements, take a look at what's going on and um, make comments to send back. So that has the opportunity to save firms money because maybe they don't need as many Civil 3D licenses or Revit now, licenses. Now is that docs or design functionality you were just talking about? Docs. Okay. Um, most of my experience is with the docs side of BIM 360. That's where I think that most of the power is when it comes to Civil 3D. Um, that's gonna serve as a fantastic place to you know, share files is like a, in a Dropbox sort of way, but it also is gonna work with your data shortcuts and, and other components of, um, of a, a, a normal Civil 3D project, project. Now, there is a question about Sheet Set Manager in BIM 360. And uh, the question is, is there you know, a limitation because it doesn't work? And I believe that to be true. Um, I would imagine it's coming in a future version. I haven't heard of anything specifically, but I believe that um, it's coming. Um, Sheet Set Manager is a very important part of a lot of production work. And you know, for it not to work, uh, out of the box is kind of unacceptable, honestly. So uh, I would say just give it time. There's been a, a lot of big changes um, to BIM 360 already. And I would imagine that's next on the radar. Yeah, BIM 360 is pretty welcome. Uh, we love having it. We've been waiting for it for a while. You know, some of our Revit folks and, and the architectural side, they've used BIM 360 extensively. And we've been waiting. And of course, most of us know this, the data shortcuts that were some of the big issues. So finally, it's here. We love having it. Uh, it's, I think a few bugs to still work out, but it's, it's pretty solid at this point from what I've seen. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool to have in your arsenal there, especially working in the cloud. Yeah, and one of the things, so uh, BIM 360, it's two different licensing models. Jason was just talking a lot about a lot of the functionality with the docs licensing, and that's just um, an alternate version of that's competing with a lot of the other file transfer sites, Dropbox, ShareFile, things like that. It's Autodesk's flavor on, on a lot of it. Uh, but like Jason was mentioning, you can open a browser for a Civil 3D file and add comments to it, even from your phone, if you wanted to. But Rob, what you were just describing was more of the BIM 360 design licensing model um, for how we can collaborate not only among other civil users, data shortcuts are, were one of the big limitations on this, X references for a really long time. Those have been ironed out. We're still waiting for things like Sheet Set Manager to get fully implemented. But I would say one of the other clear cut reasons that would be a, a big boon for civil 3D users to be experimenting with collaboration for civil is if you are using 
your, uh, or if you're collaborating with a Revit model and other Revit users in your firm or with other firms, because the workflows for getting those files to communicate with each other, whether it's from the perspective of our coordinate system or also for sharing our civil 3D surfaces with Revit, uh, Revit thinks about th surfaces very differently than civil 3D does. But BIM 360 design and the collaboration for civil makes it really easy for you to get those surfaces shared with the rest of your Revit team on your project. So I'd say that's one of the clear advantages pushing toward BIM 360. Yeah. And I have a question from Cynthia on here. If your licenses are on Prem and the data is on BIM 360, how does that work? The short answer is that uh, your licenses aren't going to be on-prem for long. Um, Civil 3D is pushing towards the named user thing. So wherever the life, the, the user would be have to log into the software to get it to work. So prem means on premises and on your server. So you're actually having a licensed server. Yep. Did that answer your question, Cynthia? But for now it should work just fine. It answers my question for now, but <laughs> does it, <laughs> but if I were to move to BIM 360, I thought the licensing was going to be um, where you can choose to keep it on-prem or take it up into the cloud. I didn't know they were going to push everybody to licenses in the cloud. That's what I believe to be true, but I am not an expert in licensing and uh, don't hold me to that. But I've okay. heard rumblings of that way that it's going to go to the named user at some point. It's been and my experience. From, oh, go ahead, from, Cynthia. Sorry, from my understanding, it is in 2022 that it's gonna be everybody, but you have a year to get there. But I have a meeting today on that, but that's, you know, I'm just trying to figure out whether to go to BIM 360 um, with everybody working from home as opposed to them coming in with VPN. Uh, at this point, my understanding, Cynthia, yes, we got to keep in mind the future considerations. How does all this licensing work? But at today, your ability to access your design software application, whether it's Revit or Civil 3D, um, Whatever you need to do to open your software, if it's a network and you have to ac open up your VPN so you can talk to that server, that is separate from your ability to use and interact with BIM 360. So if your BIM 360 requires a named user, yet your design application is a uh, network or, or whatever else, as long as you can open your design application and as long as you have the permissions to access BIM 360, those two things are currently operating independently. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So Frank is on our production side here. So I wanted him to kind of add a little bit to this as far as using BIM 360, since this is a topic right now on production and maybe some of the limitations or some of the benefits that you see with it. Well, and, and it's been my experience that anytime you use a VPN connection to access files and stuff, it slows you down, especially if you're accessing all your background files that are running through your system. So for instance, if you have all your, your, your setup files and blocks and everything like that stored on your server, it's really going to lag. It's really going to slow you down where BIM 360, you can have everything uploaded to there. You can also download everything to your uh, hard drives. Um, AutoCAD based products, let's face it, just don't like Windows. Um, so they it, it basically don't like to look a lot for different files. So the more it has to search for files and the deeper it has to dig into a file structure, it's going to give you problems. So that's where the VPN really slows you down. Uh, BIM 360 is going to be your best bet if you're working remotely. So Frank, have you noticed, uh, yes, we're, we are ATG, we are an Autodesk reseller and BIM 360 is cool and shiny, but um, we're also techs all here on this call. So we're, yep. we care about what works. Um, have you, you Frank on, on your production jobs, have you noticed any of the BIM 360 of the non Autodesk products that have performed better, less well, but to, that have some of that same functionality to get us off of a purely VPN based connection? 
Yes, um, we use we use Dropbox. Honestly, um, I don't care for it that much because when you're on Dropbox, it's like you're working on your your own hard drive. Um, it's basically pulling everything from Dropbox and opening it on your hard drive. Um, but the issue with that is is it create while it creates a DWL in Dropbox, it don't lock people out of that drawing. So more than one person can have that drawing open at a time. And there's there's a lot of sad results over that. Um, I'm getting into another situation here with a client of ours that uses a product called uh, Ignite, um, which obviously is supposed to work with everything, Sheet Set Manager and everything. So yeah, there are other options out there, um, even though we are, like we say, a Autodesk reseller and we want to push their stuff. Um, there are other, are other options that are affordable out there that, that us within the civil industry can use. Yeah, and there's, thank you, Frank, and there's actually a good comment here from Tom. So he says, I also recommend that you put any shared resources such as line types, SAX, SHX files, list routines, et cetera, on your local drive. It'll yeah. speed up CAD. Um, Definitely. That's something we recommend and we routinely set up. And Kyle, this is kind of your strong point here, especially with the with the uh, Lisp routines set up on your local drive. Can you give some advice on that? Yeah. So I have been working with a lot of clients, uh, some of them long term, some of them more one offs. But I have been a really big proponent of the um, everything in your deployment that you need to plot print draw line type, access your tool palette, all that stuff should live on your C drive. Um, not only does that make, as Tom was mentioning, for your users, make sure that they can access and or operate any files that they need um, without that internet connection. I mean, they might have to download it locally, but it's gonna help speed a lot of that stuff up. But even from a CAD manager perspective, when you're setting everything up on the C drive, in a file path that is independent of any sort of Windows username stuff, but it's just C, my company, all my files underneath it, then when you're the CAD manager, everything you do to set it up and, and test and operate is exactly the same workflow, is exactly the same file paths that your users are going to be experiencing. So for me, it's, it's shown to save a lot of time with, okay, how do I get this set up right the first time? Do I have to do any weird, goofy workarounds like map a drive on my C drive uh, that really is faking it for the network location? So has anyone else, and, and I know we're here to talk from our perspective, but I'm also really interested from the attendees, anybody else have experience with using those local profiles or having that content stored on their C drive? Well, obviously, and I'll, I'll go back to the thing that I was saying, any of your uh, support files should be on your C drive. I totally agree with what Kyle's saying there. It's less searching AutoCAD has to do. And if you start adding locations and changing locations, um, you end up running into problems. So in my mind, I agree with everything Kyle just said. You need to have your support files on your, your uh, C drive, regardless of your situation. That's where those custom profiles can help is you can have, you know, a different desktop icon to launch auto, you know, civil 3D from one for working at home and then one for working on the network. And that would easily path everything to go to your proper C drive. Um, yeah, so a couple of questions coming in here. Cynthia through the chat, Brian Haley through the Q&A interface. Um, so Cynthia is mentioning that things, you all keep your stuff over at Design Workshop on your network. And part of that has to do with your update protocols and, and making sure that everyone's using the same stuff. Brian, you're mentioning, Brian Haley is mentioning that their content is stored local and they're using some custom scripts, some Windows batch files to manage all of that. So Brian, Cynthia, I'd like to get kind of your perspectives of how it's been for keeping that stuff updated and and how that's been working in this distributed environment lately uh brian here um so yeah we've got everything stored local absolutely everything and we have a uh, uh, icons on the desktop for that are the gei civil 3d shortcut and when you double click on it it runs a batch routine that makes runs a robocopy that copies all of the files that have changed on the network down to the local system. 
And that way, if I need to make a change to something, I make a change, put it up on the network. And then the next time somebody launches CAD, it says, oh, there's a new file. Let me copy it down. And now all my users have the latest and greatest versions of everything. It works really well. Um, and what then, have you been... oh, sorry, go ahead, Brian. I was going to say that, but then as a CAD manager, I've got a, a, a file that I can put on my system that if it exists, then it doesn't synchronize so that I can make my changes. And as I launch CAD, it doesn't synchronize because then it would change my stuff back to the way it was. And then when I'm done setting up all my, doing all my changes, I have a Lisp that, or a routine that will robocopy my stuff up to the network. And then when people launch CAD, it robocopies the new stuff down to their system. Yep. That's exactly how we used to do it, um, Brian. Um, the only thing we did a little bit different with the robocopy than what you're doing is every morning when the user logged in, it would automatically update those files instead of leaving it up to the user. And if they forget to click, that way they don't get the updated material. But when they log in in the morning, it runs automatically and it updates those files. So that's another good aspect that you could look at as to going into and getting your robocopy to run automatically on login. Yeah, but the, the way we've got it is in order to use the GEI CAD standards, you have to launch CAD using the GEI shortcut. Okay. Otherwise it defaults to the, all the old stuff, you know, the out of the box stuff. Right. And so that shortcut isn't the standard civil 3D shortcut. It runs some routines, which then launches CAD once those are done. Yep. Understood. But very similar. Yeah. yeah. And Sean, Sean had a comment on there. Um, I have a hard time with the concept with the growing company still developing standards and processes. We keep on a single network drive. And yeah, and again, Sean, that, that works very well as long as you're right at your network. Um, again, if you're VPNing to get to your network, you're going to find there's going to be a long lag because of those accessing those files on the network. So if you're working uh, from your office over your network, that's going to be a different story. But if you try to go outside and get into the VPN arena and BIM 360 and all that other stuff, you're going to find there's going to be difficulties doing that. And with Brian's aspect of it, um, that's probably the easiest, most simple way to uh, coordinate between all your users. Yeah, this this is Sean. Um, yeah, uh, mo most of our staff is uh, is here locally in the office, as well as um, when we do work remotely, it's more of a remote desktop connection. So we're still live network to um, to the network remoting here rather than over a VPN. So, but I, I, I do appreciate the the RoboCopy concept because I have experienced that in the past as well, and it does seem to be a good a good concept. Yeah, yeah, working working remotely, like logging into a remote computer at the office, is a little bit different situation. Even though you do have a little bit of lag time, but still, that that works too. If you got a desktop at home, laptop or laptop at home, desktop at work. I mean, remoting in. Um, I've had positions where I had 30 different desktops I could log into and get different things running at the same time. So. Um, that 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 is handy um and again and that would work in your situation definitely thank you so for folks that are using uh some sort of automated synchronization process with your standards to get that stuff on your c drive one thing i'm kind of curious to to get a broader perspective from the group here is how does that work for larger updates? Yeah, when we when we update one template file that's a couple a meg or two, when we update a couple of macros in our tool palettes, things might change a bit or a line type file. But have you guys noticed and gals noticed anything for undesirable performance when you're trying to do larger updates or for getting new users on board and that full set of standards pushed across the the distributed network? Uh, this is Brian again. I'll go ahead and answer that one real quick. So we just deployed Civil 3D 2020. I, I know, I know. But hey, 2020 was an advancement for us. Um, and so it, that wasn't necessarily a CAD management tool routine. That was IT. Mm -hmm. And so IT created some batch routines, some whatever it, IT magic that they do. And they pushed the install files 
to the users in the background. And then once those were pushed, they then initiated the installs. Um, and in those install files was the new 2020 standards that we had developed. And so it replaced the old 2018 standards with the new 2020 standards, installed the Civil 3D 2020 all in one big routine. Um, and again, uh, that was all downloaded in the background without the user having to do anything other than hit the OK button that says, hey, this is going to download. Gotcha. So you, um, you guys found a way to bundle up your corporate content with the actual image file of the deployment. Yeah, I, IT like did that. that. I don't know what it, they were using. Sure. Kaseya, I believe, is what they were using. Cool. Which is not a tool that I'm personally familiar with. But we haven't had any major uh, CAD standard updates other than, hey, here's the new 2020 stuff. Sure. Okay. Well, thanks for all that feedback, Brian. Appreciate it. Yeah, and, I, and we don't need to spend all the time on, on this particular subject here, but I did want to throw this one out. I want to talk about it, communication as far as um, a decentralized environment. What are some methods that people have used to keep people motivated on your teams, whether they're working from home or, or whatnot throughout 2020, throughout the decentralization that we've had? Um, what are some of those tools that we can share with the group? What has worked for you guys? And we can certainly share some of ours, but wanted to hear a little bit. If anyone had anything to add to that. And if not, we could jump in. I'm gonna, we'll tackle these as they come through. Here's one here. I have a pipe network to label question. If you're interested in changing topics, if not, I understand. <laughs> no, it's good. Whatever topics come through, let's talk about it. So here, so go ahead, Brian, on that. Okay, so I'm trying to create a label style that labels both circular pipes and non-circular pipes. So circular pipes, I wanted to say 24 inch RCP. Uh, elliptical pipe, I wanted to say 23 inch by 36 inch RCP. How do I do that? I haven't been able to figure that one out. Um, uh, give, me a, give me a minute, Brian. I'm I've tried expressions checking it using the inner pipe diameter, the inner pipe height, the inner pipe width, but if the expression, that property doesn't exist, then the expression just fails. It doesn't return a value. So I was going to use that for the text height, mm -hmm. have two, two different components, but that's not working. I have... That's a good one, Brian. I figured you were going to ask that from your... Uh your Twitter stuff the other day in there, oh. <laughs> but I, I haven't had a chance to play with it. And I was hoping that Kyle would have a quick answer for you. Um, I'm digging up one of my clients deployments because I did a, a moderate overhaul with them uh, last year. Label styles. Just uh, put the, the ellipsis thought bubble buffering above my head here uh, in post-production, <laughs> Justin. Thanks. Because we do have an ellipsis. Tom had a comment on that. Have you tried using the description? I haven't yet. Um, but that would be, I would have to, well, I guess I'd have to redo all my labels anyways. But um, I, I haven't tried that yet. Um, hmm. I think that would work. You know, using the description would certainly work. But yeah, there's going to be back end setup needed to get that to work, to do yeah. exactly what you want it to do. So as far as like a quick and easy label that's just going to pull that property, that's the hard part. So I'm going to try and do this mildly sanitized. There might be a firm name in here somewhere. Um, I'll, I'll speak up when I have something to say, but uh, Brian, I got some ideas for you. Talk amongst yourselves. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and per Tom there works for box culverts, ellipticals, circular pipes. So definitely we're trying that. Great stumper question there. Good job. Good one. And as we all know, we can always fake them labels, but then you're going to create a label for every size that you want. So, or every size that you need. So that. Which that, is exactly what I'm trying to avoid. Yes, exactly. Heart size name. Thank, thank you, AutoCAD. 
right? So yeah, we can we can talk about if you guys have any specific questions as well, just for AutoCAD Simple 3D, you know, throw it in here as well. Thanks for that, Brian. Well, Kyle digs just, into that. We'll talk about yeah, go ahead, your, Jason. Your, your communication thing. Um, you know, we internally we use Slack. Um, we also use Zoom uh, for internal calls, and, and we also have soft phones. But I also run Microsoft Teams for a couple clients, so there's no lack of communication. I think our communication has gotten much better um, just in the past few weeks or months of this thing that we're going through. Um, it's almost overwhelming. You know, we've got cell phone and email and Slack and Teams, and there's no shortage of communication. But uh, there's no, someone could make a lot of money centralizing all of it and making like a tap a talk type of thing for uh, work communication. Yep. And then from Tom here, how would you suggest labeling pressure pipes, pressure pipe lengths through joints? Is not using pressure pipes an option? I second Jason's motion. <laughs> um, oh, you non no. pressure pipe users, you. <laughs> it's gotten better in 2021. There's been some good improvements uh, with that, but I haven't messed with labeling uh, recently. So, Tom, just so we can make sure we understand your your question correctly, you're saying that, um, you know, if we have like a butt joint, maybe not even a 45 or a 90, but if we're just in line, Civil 3D will treat that as two separate pipes, whereas um, in reality, we would want to tell the contractor, look, from A to B, you've got uh, 532.4 feet. Is that what you're trying to say? Is how we can look at those, get those summed together across those joints? Okay, that's correct. Um, I don't know. I haven't, to be fair, I, I have not given pressure pipes um, a, a do of thorough review in the last couple of versions. I've been helping a number of my firms work around using pressure pipes, uh, with some other catalog modifications for using the gravity tool set to get those modeled um, with, with some labels. So, I can, I can help answer some questions about how we can use gravity networks to get all of our plan production done for, for water main, but I don't use pressure enough to, to have a good one for you there. Yeah, and he well, wants to be able to use it just for some of the new features that they have on there. Sure. Yeah, and, and the, biggest, think, Frank? the biggest issue when you break a pipe, it don't matter, it's gonna tell you it's broke there. That's, I mean, if you have two pipes in the place where you only want one, then I recommend just placing it as one solid pipe all the way through. Don't put no connector. Because um, once you break it, it's thinking there's a connection there. And you, it, it's going to dimension it just as that. So, um, again, if it's a straight run and you got a break in it, uh, get rid of the break. Just make it all one pipe. Other than that, um, there's, there's no way around it. It's like... Dimensioning a, a poly line when you come to a certain point in the break, even though that poly line straight, if you break that poly line and continue on, you're going to have two separate dimensions for that line. So um, that's just how AutoCAD looks at it. I'm almost wondering if you could, uh, again, bad work or workaround, not a true solution, but even if you were to poly line over it, um, would your AutoCAD object length field, would that pull that in across breaks or would that only label a particular segment? It's still, I, it, regardless, it's only going to read the segment. It's not going to okay. read. Right. Sorry, Tom. Um, that is something that uh, that we might be able to look into more and get you a, get you an answer later on. But uh, not a quick and easy way to get that done. No. It's just uh, dealing with pressure pipes sometimes. But yeah, we can look into that. Uh, Kyle, you said you had an answer to Brian's question. Yes, I'll go ahead and I'll share my screen here. So, um, Brian, we had mentioned the possibility of you using your description for your part um, to be able to populate that. So we all know that when we, well, maybe we don't all know, 
for those of us that didn't. Whenever we add in a part family or a part size from Civil 3D's part catalog into our part list, uh, this information in that name column of our part list, that is what automatically fills in the description field for our part. Um, so if we were using a description label uh, field inside of our label style, this is what would automatically put, be put there by default. However, this is also the exact same value that is being referenced by a part builder parameter known as the part size name. Um, I can help make sure that we can get this linked up, but I did a webinar on a public webinar on some of these part catalog modifications that you can make uh, for more labeling purposes than creating the coolest parametric 3D part ever that is 100% accurate. But basically what happens is when you create a part in the first place and um, you know, we can just copy this from our default out of the box catalog where we take a, a, a random pipe, but when we give it a part name and when we give it a part description, this is information that we can track throughout Part Builder. So in order to get this elliptical concrete pipe, I, I found my existing elliptical one, I saved it as, and I'm gonna call this one RCP-E, concrete elliptical. Um, but I'm, I'm making sure that I'm using the description as a, a red thread that I wanna connect through the rest of this part building process. Once that's done, I'm actually in this part now, I'm inside it in Part Builder. And what we want to do is we want to edit the calculation of our part size name field. Uh, so when we're in Part Builder, uh, if we right click on size parameters, any one of those three values, it's the same dialogue. Um, we just get to choose where we're looking around in here. So uh, for calculations, or actually our parameter configuration is great because this is where it says, what's our little abbreviation mean? Well, what we care about here is the part size name. And so when we go to our calculations and we go find pert sn, double click on that cell, it allows us to pull up how we're actually gonna be calculating this. So every part, whether we're a circle, whether we're a, uh, an arch or an ellipse, um, is going to have some sort of dimensioning information being part of it. So with this, we can evaluate for our elliptical pipes or our arch pipes, we can call out that inner width and that inner diameter, and we can insert this. It's just like building any other label inside Civil 3D. So we're gonna insert our width, however you wanna have that show up. I'm using space, X, space, and then our height. And then the key thing here is I'm using my part description from Part Builder, not necessarily the actual part itself um, inside Civil 3D, but I'm also using that part description that's getting launched into my part size name. So in this case, uh, I'm looking at a uh, width by height RCP-E. That's, that's our name that we had up there. So by the time I save this out and I add this into Part Builder, and I bring this into my, um, my actual part list, I've added my family, I've now added in all these different sizes. Yes, this would populate my Civil 3D description field for all of these pipes, but this is also synonymous with my part size name, which is a separate field that I can use inside my label style. So if I now go check my pipe label styles uh, for a size and a type, Uh, I don't have these in here actually. Um, for those in this setup, but by using our part size name as one of those dynamic fields inside of our label style, that's going to give us our opportunity to say, when I'm round, give me one dimension. When I am uh, elliptical, give me another dimension. And it can combine can combine some of those other properties. So that might be one way. Brian, if you're looking to get that dynamic, am I round? Am I circular? Does it really matter? Um, finding a way to manipulate your part size name from your part builder 
could be able to connect that through the rest of your catalog. Does that so make thank sense? You. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to take a look at that. Uh, for some reason, my descriptions are just coming in without the sizes in it. So I've got something going on there that I'll have to look into. Okay. Uh, now, my coworker or our coworker, Jeff Haney, did recently, I think within the last month, he put out a webinar on um, some additional part builder parameters for the um, for some of this like label generation and the rest of that stuff. Um, I believe he was focusing a little bit more on our XML file editing for all of that, but um, check that out. I'm sure there's going to be some other good information for your catalog and your labeling uh, that's in there. Fantastic. Thanks, Scott. Stop sharing. All right. So anything else anybody wants to bring up here on just uh, increasing efficiency, your workflows, um, outsourcing ideas, you know, to look for the right people to help out with your projects or just anything open to this type of subject here, uh, please feel free to share. Now's the time. Or if you have any specific uh, civil 3D related issues like this, pipe networks or any of that. Don't be shy. Nobody has, nobody ever has problems with civil 3D, Rob, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> it works flawlessly. That's right. I wanna be um, in your world. <laughs> All of us, Frank, would like to be in that world. Yes, right. It gives us a new challenge every day, right? Civil 3D. Oh, this hey, real Sean. quick. On a, I'm sorry, Sean. Let me follow up with a comment that Tom made from the, the chat there because it's a really weird nuance. If you're going to be using inch ticks inside your part size name, Part Builder does not like the quote symbol that puts both of those together. So you may have to use two individual apostrophes right next to each other. Um, so I typed that into the chat window, but I wanted to make sure that that got addressed because it's a really dumb asterisk that's like easy to, for, super easy to forget about. Uh, sorry about that, Sean, go ahead. No, that's fine. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be a similar answer as to what you guys answered about uh, like a spanning label for pressure pipes, except with gravity pipes. Is there a way to do a spanning label between, you know, uh, from structure to structure? Um, I just not structure to structure through a structure. So that way you have a pipe on one side of a structure, a pipe on another. I'm assuming there's a way to do that. I just haven't been able to research enough to figure that out. Yeah, it's in there. I, the terminology is escaping me currently. I don't have civil open, but uh, you can get it to label center to structure to center of structure. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a rule, uh, I believe. It's a rule. Okay. Um, pipe or structure. However, there are there's one or two rules that show up in both pipe or structure. Um, for any of those that are there, I would suggest the best practice of only define it in one rule set uh, rather than having them both try and compete with each other. Uh, pipe rules. Edit. Yeah, it would be, I think it's the pipe match is shared between both structures and pipes being invert or crown or center with a standard drop. Yeah, and structures, it's the pipe to pipe match. Sorry, pipes, it's the pipe to pipe match. Structures, it's the pipe drop across structure. Only set that one time. Yeah, it looks like Tom has a solution on there. Thanks, Tom. In the chat. Add labels, pipe network, spanning pipes plan or spanning pipes profile. Yeah, that's why I said I thought I had seen that at some point. I just hadn't had a chance to uh, re research that, and somebody had brought up something here, going, "Hey, can I need to label through these structures." So, all right, thank you. All right, thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia had the bell here. Um, 
Yes. Any anything else? Any other questions like that? This is good. Now's the time just to get together as a, a group and ask these type of questions. Stump us again. We'll get some answers for you. Productivity. Let's move into that. Productivity efficiency. Anybody on the panel here or anybody in the group have any ideas for just making things more efficient? Any new uh, tools you found? Definitely. We got plenty we can share. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is our time to shamelessly self promote the, the CTC Express tools um, for helping you get your designs and your plans put together faster. Um, have one question I'm curious about though, for firms who are already customers of the CTC Express tools, um, have you noticed widespread adoption once those tools get implemented and, and purchased or do those are those only known and used by a select few individuals at the company? Uh, this is Sean. We actually limited the uh, release to certain people in the office rather than giving it to everybody. Uh, in the beginning, it was just kind of to test it out. So we didn't want to give it to you because as there's obviously some knowledge and understanding that, that requires using some of those tools. So it was more of a security on our part as to why we didn't just blanket release it to everybody. Okay. And then Sean, for, for yourself or for those other users, have, have they been appreciative of having these tools to kind of claw back some of those inefficiencies that are baked into this crazy COVID 2020 year? Um, have they been using them more? Have they been more thankful or is there just kind of a general baseline appreciation or usage of them? I think there there's, everybody kind of has their favorites. It all kind of depends on, a, on a kind of their experience level and what they typically do and how they use uh, the software on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's a, it's a general appreciation of, of, the, of, the, of the set itself. I know as, as a whole, we don't use all the tools in there, but you know, I don't know that. Most firms don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to bring that up with Tom too. He said he started using Microsoft Planner to track to-do tasks for projects, including due dates and assignments. That's a good one. I haven't tried that one before. I've used that before in different companies, but again, it's just for tracking um, what you're doing and stuff that, that, that don't help as far as design work and stuff like that, but it keeps you up to date on where you are on your schedule. It, it's a great tool. Anybody using other tools? I know Trello is kind of a popular one. I, on a lot of my projects, I'm using Smartsheet um, to, to have kind of cloud sourced big access, but uh, anybody else using some of these third-party just project management softwares? I wish I would have had a chance this morning to look into that Ignite. Um, that looks like it's going to be an interesting tool, and it's very, very inexpensive for the cloud base you get. So, I mean, you can pay anywhere. If you get $10, I was looking at it, and it's like $10 a user per month. Um, but if you go $20 a month per user, you get an extra gig of storage just for that user. So, I mean, depending on how many users you've got, it, it, it seems like it's going to be a well-rounded. But again, I haven't used it. Um, be working with a client that will be. Is there anybody out there that has used Ignite or heard of it? Um, I'd like to hear your input. And just yeah, so you know, brought... just so you know, that's spelled E G N Y T E. Ignite. And you brought up Trello. That's something I've used quite a bit in the past. And I like the card based system, but you also brought up Smartsheet, which I don't know if you know that, Kyle, but that actually does a card based system as well. It's just a setting in there that you change. Very powerful, very powerful program. Yeah, I typically use mine in spreadsheet mode, but um, card, the card mode might be a little bit cleaner for some of those. Um, and even, I, I guess, to, to admit to the broader user base here, even we get stuck in the things that we know and, and we're all still 
looking for those next solutions. But um, yes, even when we're really busy and we're under the gun, sometimes we stick to what we know and, uh, and can still use that broader education. So that's why we get together and talk. Uh, Tom wanted to comment that he wasn't particularly impressed with Ignite um, the, and the fact that it required a uh, NAS solution. Um, which did a little bit of speed limitation and connection. So a little bit of those bigger files, particularly with pipe networks, uh, were taking 20 minutes longer to open up. Uh, yeah, I would not be happy with that either. Yeah, that's what's kind of interesting to me. The, company, the client that we're going to be working with here has very, very large sites. Um, I'm going to be curious to see how they handle that situation. Thank you, Tom, for that input. Yeah, taking 20 minutes to open a dry, and that's going old school. That's back in the day. Yeah, that and it, and it sounds like um, if you're using larger pipe network drawings, I mean, if you're using a large area of, of pipe networks, of course, just like creating large scaled roads, uh, expressways and, and cross country travel roads, um, you're gonna wanna break that down if it gets too large, and that could be part of the problem with that. So. Um, I guess I, I'm going to be curious to see how they use it because they're really impressed and they've been using it for years. So something I wanted to bring up here is Bluebeam. Anybody using Bluebeam on the team here besides us? I know as a panel we use it. Or even knows what Bluebeam is, what the functionality of it is, how much it can help. We actually, this is Sean, we actually went through and just finished uh, converting everybody, everybody but a handful of resistors to Bluebeam from Adobe. So our office is almost, I'd say 95, 98% Bluebeam users. Um, and a lot of the uh, engineers and PMs are starting to uh, do digital markups with that. That was kind of how we, how we pushed it and said it was so much better than Adobe. And so there's been a lot of, uh, of benefits that we've noticed on, on our end. So what specifically, Sean, are the folks at your firm using Bluebeam for? Are you trying to do QTO? Are you just doing basic red lines? Are you using the studio sessions for collaboration? Well, because we, you know, most of our staff is here in the office, so we don't really have the use for studio sessions. I like that concept and that idea. Um, I did kind of bring it up to a few people that, you know, it is an option with that, but mostly it's, it's uh, um, just, it, it's it's really basic, simple redline stuff. It's not even QTO stuff. So I know it's you know having said that you know probably very very much underutilizing what it can do, but as of right now, it's you know it's it's a lot better than a lot of the tools and stuff that Adobe had at least for the markups and and from that con from that perspective. Yep, and Jason, this is a good. Uh a point to talk about here. What is the learning curve on Bluebeam? We do a lot of training on Bluebeam, just, you know, kind of mentoring on that, but what, to get someone up to speed on what they need to do with what we do. You know, and, and that's what I really like about Bluebeam Review is that it doesn't take much to learn. Um, I feel I've done a lot of training for it and we go anywhere from one hour to eight hours. And most people can feel pretty confident and dangerous within an hour or two. Um, you know, anything more than that, if we're doing a four hour session or an eight hour session, that's when you're really getting into the nuts and bolts of every little function. But with most people and probably about two hours, they are, it will be able to, you know, create the custom tools that they need to do, uh, make considerable uh, markups and measurements, and they'll be able to, you know, do their main admin work with it too. If they need to compile plans or number them, um, they can do that. There's uh, a ton of, you know, ton of ways it can be used, of course, but um, it's really simple. I, I would agree with that. You know, most of what I experienced here was a resistance to something new because it's they didn't know it. And so it was a, hey, well, Adobe used to do this. How do I do this? So, but yeah, I, I would say within, you know, because obviously we don't use it on a daily hourly basis within a week to two weeks everybody was pretty much on board and okay with it and within a month people were like wow i really wish we would have switched sooner because adobe this is so much better than adobe mm -hmm. um now as far as performance goes it does seem to be 
a little bit slower in opening and managing drawings than Adobe did. But other than that, that was kind of the, the general consensus of, of uh, when it went through and upgraded everybody. What version are you on? Uh, 19 uh, CAD, okay. CAD review. Yeah, because I know, and that was one thing I was looking into, and I think you guys just did a, a webinar on the 2020, and I didn't see any significant differences. You know, I was, I was looking for, hey, this is new in 2020, but I didn't see anything significant that, um, other than I believe on the collaboration side, and since we don't use that side, it didn't look like it was something we were, you know, going to pursue right away. Right. And there, you know, with every update to Bluebeam review, there are some, you know, bug fixes and things like that. So there's benefit in just, just in updating for the, the sake of getting a faster, more stable program. As far as new functions, I mean, the biggest one that I've noticed, if you're not going to use uh, anything in the markups list or, uh, or the studio sessions is going to be the ability to change from a call out to a text box pretty easily. Um, it's kind of a handy thing if you're doing markups, but otherwise it's not, it's not a huge change, but um, I've, I've been noticed a little bit of an, a performance uh, gain on my side, but you know, that all depends on how big your PDF file is anyway. But uh, I've been using Bluebeam for uh, a number of years and I'm just can, always a big fan. So yeah, Jason, oh, oh, go ahead, Frank. No, go ahead, Kyle. Go. Oh, I was going to say, uh, for a little more context for the broader group, um, Sean, you had mentioned that you're using the CAD version of Bluebeam. There are, what, three different model or three different levels of Bluebeam. Jason, can you explain a little bit more about the functionality between those different tiers? There's technically, you could say there's five versions because you've got a, a free version called uh, View. You've got the iPad version, you know, which is great for people going out in the field. And then the three three main desktop versions are going to be standard, CAD, and extreme. And the price difference between them uh, isn't huge. Um, it's, you know, 100, uh, 100 to 150 bucks between the versions. But standard is loaded with a ton of great features. It can do 90% of what 90% of people do. CAD is going to add in some plugins for Revit and Sybil 3D and Outlook and Excel, where you can create uh, easy one-click PDFs. It will also do 3D PDF. So if you're a Revit firm, uh, you definitely want the CAD version. And then Extreme adds on to the CAD functions by giving you more uh, automated batch script, uh, batch stuff. So if you need to stamp and seal a 100 uh, page set of plans, you can do that with a couple clicks. It's also better with OCR or your optical character recognition. And it can so it turns also- turns raster into vector. It does- For a text. Little, Somewhat, yeah, um, depending on the quality, of course. And then uh, it's also got better form creation functions as well as uh, the quantity link. The quantity link um, gives you an ability to pull a column or a cell from your quantity list or your markup list and tie that directly to a cell in Excel, Microsoft Excel, that updates in real time. So you can create, uh, you know, if you're doing estimate of quantities or anything like that, it becomes really simple. Look for uh, another one coming up here. We'll be doing another one of these Ask ATGs. And if you have any ideas um, on what you'd like to talk about specifically, let us know. But it was great uh, seeing everybody here. So we'll see you next time around. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank I'll you. launch a poll right now.